on this episode of In the Fight. U.S. policymakers and military leaders lay out their plan for fighting the new terrorist threat. We learn how four Air Force officers provide weather for the entire military. Marine Corps military police in Japan keep their sidearm skills sharp. Service members prepare a major coalition base for handover to the Afghanistan government. And airmen fly flags high over Afghanistan in tribute to loved ones and fallen brothers. Since coalition forces withdrew from Iraq at the end of 2011, a new terrorist group known as ISIS or ISIL has gained traction in the Middle East. Policymakers and military leaders are making it clear that while the United States will offer support, including airstrikes, its main goal is to build up a new coalition of nations to take on this threat together. The United States, along with partner nations Bahrain, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, struck ISIL targets in Syria overnight. U.S. aircraft conducted six airstrikes in Iraq. 14 strikes were carried out. 11 airstrikes. 13 airstrikes against ISIL-controlled oil refineries. Hitting ISIL fighters, training compounds, headquarters, and command and control facilities in several areas. The president said the U.S. is building a broad coalition to dismantle and destroy ISIL. In this effort, we do not act alone nor do we intend to send U.S. troops to occupy foreign lands. Instead, we will support Iraqis and Syrians fighting to reclaim their communities. Even in a region that has been virtually defined by division over these past years, leaders who agree on very little in general are all in agreement that ISIS has to be defeated. These folks have now taken over territory in ways that Al-Qaeda never did. They have access to money in ways that Al-Qaeda never did. They have access to weapons that they captured from Iraqis. And, and they're holding that territory and beginning to try to build a capacity for sustainability that challenges everybody. ISIL, um, whatever support that they have anywhere they are, is out of fear and intimidation. Uh, it's their, their, base, their whole uh, structure on a warped ideology, which is just brutal and barbaric at its very root. Uh, and we have seen that even those sympathetic Sunni populations have now begun to turn on ISIL uh, and start to either leave the group or certainly stop supporting the group. With coalition partners and contributions, we will begin building a force of vetted, trained, moderate Syrians to take on ISIL in Syria. We will work to ensure that they have a Syrian chain of command and report to a moderate political authority. This is not just an American effort, number one, and number two, it is not just military, not just kinetic, even within the military. We have more than 50 countries now contributing in one way or another with specific understanding of what those countries will do. Some will provide ammunition, some will help with the delegitimizing, some will engage in definancing, some will engage in military assistance, some in training and assist, some in kinetic activities. And whether in Iraq or in Syria, these terrorists will learn the same thing that the leaders of Al-Qaeda already know. We mean what we say. Our reach is long. If you threaten America, you will find no safe haven. We will find you eventually. Whether the mission calls for combat or humanitarian assistance, knowing the weather is key to success. Air Force Tech Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz talks to an officer stationed at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, tasked with providing weather information to warfighters around the globe. Weather is one of the only components in a battle that you, you just can't change. And being able to predict it accurately gives the American warfighter the leg up in any combat situation. My name is Captain Tyson Johnson. I am the ground system flight commander at the NOAA Satellite Operation Facility. 
On a daily basis, my team and I make sure that the DMSP constellation, which is the only military weather satellite, is functioning and that it's able to get its data to the warfighter in a timely manner. From the flights that are going across the country to knowing whether or not it's going to be a good day to go to the beach. This information is very vital. It really affects everybody. I think we've got a great mindset with the warfighter in mind. I mean, if, if we can't predict the weather well, those guys that are in the fight, if they get hurt, medevac helicopters aren't going to fly. So one of the things that we provide is modeling for sandstorms. And that's a huge concern for rotary wing aircraft. And to be able to predict the wind and how that sandstorm is moving, how fast it's moving, it's gonna give them the window that they need to get off the ground. I support that effort. Probably the number one priority of any space operator is the health and safety of their constellation. So we're not just looking at weather here on Earth. We look at space weather as well. Solar flares, solar winds, anything that's out there that could potentially damage our spacecraft. Being able to provide weather data in space is a very important part of any kind of space ops, and we do that here. Our team is made up of four military personnel, three captains and a major and we've got the stick here. We make sure that the warfighter has weather data, we ensure that the ground system is capable of performing the mission, and that the satellite sensors are performing as, as expected. If not, then we bring together the coalition of, of mission partners that we need in order to get the weather data back in the fight. The weather prediction that we're able to provide, both for civilian and military applications out of this facility, really is the gold standard for both civilian and military weather prediction. And to be in this position here and now making the kind of decisions that I'm making that impact an entire seven satellite constellation is pretty incredible. My name is Staff Sergeant Thompson. This is MWD Spike at Kandahar Air Force Base. I would just like to get a shout out to my wife, Sarah, Sophia, and Stella at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. I love you guys and I hope to see you very soon. I am CW2 Chris Rucker in Kandahar, Afghanistan. I'd like to say hi to all my family back in West Virginia. I love you, I miss you, I can't wait to see you. Hi, I'm Captain Aaron Griffith with 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team, 1st Infantry Division here in Tambourine, Kuwait. I'd like to give a warm shout out to my wife, Rachel. I love you, hon. I'll be home soon. Coming up, we take a look at snipers in training and service members prepare to hand over a major base in Afghanistan. Check out DividsHub.net for the latest accurate and reliable information as In the Fight continues. The longest recorded sniper kills are from approximately what distance? The answer when we return. I lost my brother Frank in the Battle of Iwo Jima. He served on four combat tours. In Vietnam. In Iraq. In Afghanistan. There's a life that was lost behind that pin. I put it on for my wife. For my husband. My brother. My dad. My son. We wear it because we honor those that we lost. To learn more about the stories behind the Gold Star Pins, visit goldstarpins.org. When you put on the uniform, you are held to a higher standard. A lot of times, you're not going to know what's going to be thrown at you, so you need to be ready for anything. Stress can affect every Marine and Marine family. It's very hard for me to have a career when we're always moving around. We have the same bills that everybody else does. And you never want to let your staff and see who is down. The de-stress line provides anonymous counseling for Marines and Marine families when it's needed most. It takes courage to ask for help. Call today and let us help you win your personal battles. I want to give a shout out to my family and friends. I want to send a shout out to my husband, to my parents, my family back home. I'd like to give a shout out to my girlfriend, to my family and friends in Lansing, Michigan, to my family out in Tucson, Arizona, to my beautiful wife and children in Des Moines, Iowa, to everybody in Texas, in York, Pennsylvania, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, Harrisburg, Virginia, Orlando, Florida, Oceanside, California, and Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I love you guys, I miss you, and I hope I'll see you soon.
The longest recorded sniper kills are from approximately what distance? The answer is C, 1.5 miles. Coalition forces are actively transferring responsibility to their Afghan counterparts, but base security is still a joint effort. Army Sergeant Christopher Toby follows one team of Marines on a two-day mission to secure Camp Leatherneck while advising Afghan soldiers. Marines with 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, left the security of Camp Leatherneck to conduct a two-day mission with their Afghan counterparts in a rural area of the Helmand province. They established a temporary patrol base and immediately started launching patrols. On this mission, the U.S. Marines and the Afghan soldiers had very specific roles. Basically, what we'll do when we go out on an intelligence-driven mission like this is uh, we'll take them to the actual compounds and uh, they'll clear it because they're dealing with their people, so it's, it's best to have them being the face that these people see. This is their country. Uh, this, is, this is gonna be their mission when we leave. So we're just setting them up for success in the future. So it's, it's good for them and it's also a good experience for us to get to work with a different style military. On this particular mission, their objective was to search a number of compounds in the area where insurgents were believed to be operating. Shortly after they began their search, it became obvious that the intelligence was the accurate. We just took a, a corner, quick burst, direction, straight east, distance, probably about a click. I mean, we did take a little bit of small arms fire uh, for the most part, actually for the entire time we were out there, really. Um, but the ANA seemed to be pretty eager to get the job done. We were holding security for them. Um, they seemed to keep pushing through to objective to objective. And even when we leave, they're still going to be willing to get the job done no matter what they have to do, really. During the firefight, the Marines successfully engaged the enemy, killing two insurgents and wounding two others. They provided the Afghan soldiers the opportunity to accomplish their objective, as well as the valuable experience of witnessing firsthand how to react under fire. Sergeant Scott Profiter, who led the Marines, said that he was proud of their actions. I'm halfway superfluous most of the time because I have good subordinate leaders under me that have been trained well and know what to do under fire. Reporting from Helmand Province, Afghanistan, I'm Sergeant Christopher Toby. Snipers are often thought of in solitary roles. Almost always by a sniper's side, however, is a more experienced spotter. Army Sergeant Megan Barry finds out what it takes to be a spotter and a sniper and brings us this story. All right, I want you to raise it up a mil and a quarter mil left. Re-engage. Got him. Being the new guy isn't easy. And just days after arriving to Fort Carson, Sergeant Justin Strickland has already hit the ground running, teaching some of his new squad members the best techniques, not only as a sniper, but also for the unsung key player, the spotter. Okay, the spotter is, is the more experienced of the two. There, there's a lot of, people think the sniper does everything. The shooter, the one that pulls the trigger is the one that, that knows everything. That's not true. The spotter is the more experienced. He's the one that's doing all the math, all the calculations for when, um, what the shooter's corrections need to be. And really the rounds in the shooter's weapon are the spotters. He's going to tell the shooter exactly what to do and when to do it. It's a job that really requires a specific sort of soldier. You gotta have patience. You have to have patience and just be able to learn from your mistakes and just take your time. In formation, I want you to shoot the second one from the left, got it? Reporting from Fort Carson, Colorado, I'm Army Sergeant Megan Barry. Being able to take down an enemy from a distance is quite a challenge but being able to use a pistol effectively is much more practical in close quarters. Marine Corporal Trevor Phillips shows us how military police in Japan stay sharp with their sidearms. When I'm shooting a pistol, there's actually really not a lot going through my mind. Although every Marine is a rifleman, Corporal Corey Hall and other military police officers aboard the air station qualify with the M9 Beretta so they're prepared to react to a threat in any given situation while giving them the confidence they need behind the trigger. I think the most challenging part for any shooter in general is just to relax. Because the more you overthink it and the more you tell yourself, oh, I'm not doing that good or I'm gonna miss this shot, the more you're gonna mess up. Marines assigned to the Provost Marshal's office have a lot more riding on their performance here than just a score or new marksmanship badge. Marines get an environment allowing them to concentrate on familiarization with their weapon 
making these Marines more effective when a real situation arises. In case I would have to use it on my job, you know, it makes me a little bit more proficient about using that weapon and be able to shoot uh, accurately. That's the biggest thing about it is being able to hit that target if uh, we have a threat of any kind. You know, you can only, you can't be too complacent. You gotta stay up on those claws. That way you know that the situation comes about, hey, I can handle it, you know, without worry. For me, that's why it's important as far as my job and what I do for this installation. Rifles are indeed the go-to weapon for Marines of any MOS. But community policing requires a more passive but still reliable tool for everyday duty. Whereas rifle, if you carry a rifle, you're also giving that show of force anywhere in the world that you go. It could be back in the States, it could be here in Japan, it could be in Afghanistan. Just carrying a pistol on your side, you look a little more approachable. Rifles just show the world that, hey, we're here to fight. Pistols just show, hey, we're here to keep the peace. Reporting from Marine Corps Air Station Iwakuni, Japan, I'm Corporal Trevor Phillips. After 12 years in operation as a major logistics hub for ISAF, Camp Phoenix is being officially handed over to the government of Afghanistan, one of the latest steps of troop drawdown across the country. Army Sergeant Vincent Petican tells us more in this report. Soldiers from the 48th Infantry Brigade Combat Team out of Macon, Georgia, are taking part in a momentous occasion, one that required months of planning between coalition forces and the Afghan government. Uh, Camp Phoenix has had this perception of being the place to go. Everybody wanted to come here, and, and when we came here in January, it was obvious that it had been a place for people to, to homestead. Uh, there were a lot of logistics services here. There were a lot of people here that, that just migrated here of their, on, of their own accord and just stayed. Over the last decade, Camp Phoenix was a major logistics hub that has played a critical role for coalition forces in Afghanistan. Lieutenant Colonel Alex McLemore commander of Camp Phoenix Base Support Group says that the base rose out of the need for a logistics type footprint, a logistics type hub, and it fed the entire Kabul base cluster. And then it grew, it grew into where it eventually fed, there were theater assets that were, that were based here. Now, coalition forces are tearing down what was just a bustling logistics hub a few months ago and transferring the base to the Afghan government. With a few quick signatures, the base becomes the property of the Afghan government, signifying the continued effort of coalition forces to ensure that the Afghan government and its people have the necessary tools to remain successful. Army Sergeant Vincent Pedikin, Kabul, Afghanistan. My name is Lieutenant Joseph Perez, currently in Kandahar, Afghanistan. I just want to give a shout out to my mom and all my family in Seattle, Washington, and my dad in Stuttgart, Germany. I miss you, I love you, and I'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Major Pearl Christensen. I'm here in uh, Kandahar, Afghanistan, and I wanted to say happy birthday to Isabella. Uh, miss you, see you soon. What's up, my name is PFC Jose Fernandez. I'm currently located in Kandahar, Afghanistan. I want to send a big shout out to my family back in Boston, Massachusetts. Anisha, Angelo, John, Shonda, I love you guys, miss you guys, can't wait to see y'all. Coming up, Air Force refuelers keep aircraft in the sky during exercise Valiant Shield. And we'll showcase some of the best photos from our service members as In the Fight, presented by Divids, continues. What year was the 50th star added to the American flag? The answer when we return. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divids, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7. Training is about more than muscle. It's about inner strength. So I push myself. That's why I serve in the United States Coast Guard. I train with the best, a team that shares my drive and commitment. We collect intelligence, guard our shores against drug smugglers, and keep our waterways safe, because our nation expects more. If you expect more, maybe you were born ready. Find out at GoCoastGuard.com.
What year was the 50th star added to the American flag? The answer is B, 1960. When conducting aerial missions over the Pacific Ocean, there isn't a lot of ground to land on. During Exercise Valiant Shield, Air Force Tech Sergeant Robert Smith hitched a ride with a crew of aerial refuelers who are tasked with keeping aircraft in the sky. During Exercise Valiant Shield, seeing this at Anderson Air Force Base is common. Helping to keep these planes in the sky is what this KC-135 crew does on a daily basis. Plus, this exercise gives them opportunities to enhance their skills in the joint arena. The joint part of Valiant Shield is great. We get to work with our Navy forces and the Marine forces, uh, people that we don't get to normally work with a lot. Uh, so, so being with them up here in the air really helps us get used to, to working with everybody and solidifying our, our team when we come up here to fly. Every member of their team plays an important role, from the pilots to the boom operator. Oh, he's critical. He's our eyes and our ears in the back, and he makes sure the gas gets delivered. Our job is basically to make sure that the boom operator gets, gets to the right place in the right time so he can give the, the fighters and the other aircraft the gas. And the boom operator on this refueling mission during Exercise Valiant Shield is Airman Corey Drummond, whose dreams of being in the air existed long before he joined the Air Force. This is exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly my whole life. And I, I couldn't be a pilot, so this, this is a pretty good alternative to pilot. Corey has only been in the Air Force for two years, but has a great understanding of the impact of his job. Just to keep the planes in the air, have the have ability to fly around all day, get their training done, show what we really can do in the air, keep the mission going. It, it's extremely important, definitely for our fighters. Refueling planes can be stressful enough without an exercise going on, but it's no problem for Corey Drummond. Oh man, it's game time. It's like Monday Night Football. I'm ready to go. When this door open, it's, it's a spark, man. I enjoy this job. The views you get, you get another jet about 20 feet away from you. You don't get to do that nowhere else. Many people play a part in keeping planes in the sky during Valiant Shield. It just so happens that for airmen like Corey Drummond and the rest of this KC-135 crew, they do it at 25,000 feet in the air. Air Force Sergeant Robert Smith, Anderson Air Force Base, Guam. The Stars and Stripes are a symbol for unity and pride for many Americans. For some deployed service members, flags can represent a great deal more. Staff Sergeant Lindsey Prax explains in this report. Flying the flag uh, over Afghanistan is really more of a, more of a tribute, uh, more of a, a symbolic tribute to the 2,341 U.S. servicemen and women that made that ultimate sacrifice here in Afghanistan. There's so many differences and variations throughout the United States, throughout American culture, um, but the flag seems to be uh, what's totaled up at the bottom. All the right, wrong, and different, your view, my view, it's all wrapped up into that. I can't think of a more powerful symbol that exists in modern times. It's a symbol of my duty, my commitment uh, to not only, uh, not only country, but our, our commitment here, what we have done, what we continue to do, uh, those who came before me and those who, who will come after me. Uh, the first two flags I flew, uh, I sent to my children. It's a bookmark for the pages that we wrote in history. And, and I think that's important that they be able to go back to that chapter and reread it because there's some valuable lessons that were learned. My, me personally, um, I, uh, I, just, I just sent a flag home. I've, uh, I flew a flag here in uh, Tim Bubble of every aircraft I have flown since I arrived. Um, and over 300 hours, uh, 300 of hours of flight with one flag, and it's, uh, it's sent home and it's now flying over Clinton, Arkansas. I have one flag left. To me, it's, it's a very important one. It's the one that I saved to the very end for my wife. I'm gonna fly it for her, and the importance of it being the last flag that I'm flying, it kinda is, is closure for her. You know, it's, it's the final mission. I know that, you know, we, as husband and wife, we share a lot of stuff, but it's important that she receives her her own flag, not something that we share. For me to her, that represents the years of turmoil that she's suffered through, all the challenges of being a military wife. Um, I honestly cannot do what I do on a daily basis without her and without the support that she's given me over the years. So that one's particularly near and dear to my heart. 
just because she is. Divids is a 24-7 operation that provides a timely, accurate, and reliable connection between the media and the military serving worldwide. Through a network of over 200 portable satellite transmitters around the globe and a distribution hub in Atlanta, Georgia, Divids gives you access to the front lines with live and archived broadcast video, still imagery, and print products. Visit our website at DividsHub.net and search through our enormous video and photo library. Register on our website to gain complete access to high-definition content, along with breaking news alerts and webcasts from top military officials. For questions or comments about In the Fight or Divids, you can email us at ondemand at DividsHub.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As we close, we feature some of the best photos that Divis has to offer. As we listen to Eddie Horst's composition, Pangea. See you next time, In the Fight.